that as a uh, kickoff thought. Let's go to our breakout rooms. Now, the breakout rooms are very important, so I'm not going to take a lot of time talking about them. We have 30 minutes for each room. The moderator is going to be somewhat ruthless and seeking real nuggets because we're going to then have 45 minutes for the moderators to come back and report out on what they glean from the 30 minutes of discussion. And so they're each only going to have like two or three minutes to report out their gleanings. So uh, let's get into it. A uh, reminder that a couple of the rooms have um, uh, poster sessions in them, just a handful. And those people will be given their five or six minutes to talk about their specific innovation. Uh, and one theme or uh, one room or two have, um, you know, major themes, and those have been pre-enrolled, like hacking for oceans. Welcome back, everybody. Let's give everybody 30 seconds or a minute to just stand up and stretch and um, really reach out for a second after that breakout group. And we're going to start uh, with Jim Chung. So, Jim, you have 30 seconds to sort of get your head around it. You didn't know you were going to be first up. But we're going to go down uh, the slide that you're looking at now, and we're going to hear from the breakout groups, and we're going to hear from Jim, then Babu, Todd, Jeff, going down that line, and then we'll shift over to Ali and Philip and Jim going down that side. Okay, so 15 seconds of pure stretch. Stretch out sideways, stretch up high. <clears throat> yes, I do do this in class. <laughs> if you're wondering. That's practice. Oh, James O'Connor, you have a good stretch going. I like that one. Uh, yeah. Thanks for joining the Lean Educators Yoga Session. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> All right. I'm always Five, stiff. Four, get that stretch in. Three, two. All right, Jim Chung, are you in the room? I am here. Can you hear me? We do. You're up. All right. Great. So um, our room had a really great diversity of participants. Um, and our, um, our focus was uh, primarily on the Main Street questions and kind of the non-traditional groups that we typically haven't spoken about in this particular summit where we focus primarily on the deep tech stuff. So we were actually talking a lot about um, uh, pre-university um, uh, education and innovation. So how do we make sure that our students who may be falling behind and may not have been able to um, keep up because of the COVID pandemic, how do we make sure that they're on track after we get back? Um, one of the participants um, is uh, homeschools her kids and she was talking about how important the flipped classroom approach has been and um, being able to use that, um, continue to use that going forward. And of course, this is something that, um, that we've used quite a bit of in our i programming. Um, so um, the importance of that. We also talked about um, uh, the uh, pr uh, educating people in the prison systems and how um, what happens to them after they come out. And so we spoke a, a bit about um, you know, not just focusing on, focusing on what's the urgent stuff that we have to do, but with some purposeful planning, trying to make sure that we are adjusting uh, for, their return, for their return and the return to normalcy after we get back. Um, we we talked some about um, also how do we how do we work with these uh, companies that these startups that are maybe not so much innovation driven but necessity driven because uh, of the dislocations um, being created by COVID nineteen and economic dislocation. Um, so one of the things that we thought that would be increasingly more important, actually an advantage of having a lot more of this remote technology, is that mentorship becomes a lot easier. Rather than having to get people face-to-face -face meeting, we're now able to connect people. And in our case at GW, now we, instead of just mentors locally, we are being able to bring the right mentors from around the country or even around the world to help um, our students um, with uh, mentoring. So those were the main points that we had time to discuss in our group. Very cool, Jim. I really like that you uh, went in that direction. <clears throat> Very helpful. And now I know I can poach your mentors. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to break my order that I uh, announced and I'm going to hop over to Ali because I think she has to leave the meeting early. So Ali Hawks, can you go ahead? 
Great, thanks. Um, thanks. So we had a really good discussion in our group. Again, people from all over, which is really exciting. And I think one of the things that struck from people's shared experiences is that there's no kind of common thread of experience that we have seen people experience like highly engaged teams, highly motivated, taking advantage of being virtual and conducting extreme customer discovery to the other side where teams who might've started out strong at the beginning of COVID and found it easier to do things virtually have now hit a serious virtual fatigue and are kind of disengaged um, and not excited about it and just really exhausted, too exhausted to take anything more on. So one of the things that we learned, or a couple of things that we learned from the group was to really encourage students to learn the skill to consult with each other, which I thought was fantastic. So that kind of shares um, the teaching experience, but really giving a crucial skill to the students to be able to guide each other and say, well, like, what did you learn about your customer discovery? And what did you learn about the value proposition? And kind of take the role of the educator a little bit. One observation that was really excellent was that conversations have, when we talked about cohesion amongst teams and students, was that conversations have become more one-to-one. -one. That's with the educator and with themselves. And we're no longer having these bigger networked conversations where you can have the serendipitous meet at the water cooler or the trade show and kind of increase the creativity. But because of that, some of these interactions um, have become more meaningful and purposeful um, because they're very focused. You know, they're trying to, one of the lessons we learned is um, shorten the time that you're going to um, do things. So you can no longer do a full day. You can kind of three hours max that you wanna do it virtually, but it's forced educators to become much more coherent and clear about what they want to achieve with their teams and their students. But my observation overall, and not necessarily group, so if I got this wrong, sorry, was that it, it felt like a bit of a decrease of creativity um, because it felt a little bit more rigid. And then um, the last two things is just not pretending it's business as usual was a great lesson. And to make space that people might be affected by COVID personally or within their family or wider organization and to allow that to be a part of the new normal. Um, so to hold space for that. And I think that was raised by one of the first speakers and what they did at their, um, at their venture capital firm. And then last is just using tools like Mural and Slack to really create that sense of community and ongoing collaboration. So a lot of really good lessons learned and great observations um, that people are putting into their thought about being an educator during this time. And I will end there. Oh, that's great, Ali. Thanks. A lot of things that we're all probably doing, um, you know, incidentally, but you're, as you're suggesting, maybe we need to be more intentional as we do them and uh, with focus. Thank you very much. Uh, hopping back to the other side, Babu, could I ask you to take next? I see you. You're on mute, Babu. Still. Okay, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, so in our recall session, you know, we are focused on the uh, uh, distance learning, some of, you know, some of the issues and some of the good things that worked out. Uh, so some of the good things that they liked was, uh, you know, being able to institute virtual pitching, virtual customer discovery. Uh, then uh, in some cases, they were able to recruit, you know, host a special session to motivate faculty and students and thereby be able to recruit them. Uh, then in some cases, you know, for the breakout sessions that they held uh, during the Zoom classes, by maintaining the same team chemistry, the same team conversation, those breakout sessions worked out really well compared to when they had split teams, you know, different groups meeting different times. Uh, and then also uh, reinforcing the lectures with examples during the Zoom session also helped. Uh, some of the issues discussed were, you know, how do you create energy during <laughs> Zoom sessions, uh, especially during international calls? Yeah, with uh, a thousand people. <laughs> I, I know. And then the other thing was, uh, it, you know, one person noted that, uh, you know, there's a drop off in engagement after one hour. I mean, we, we, and, I, I, and for, you know, clarity, I asked, what do you mean by drop off? Basically, they just disappear. <laughs> From, from the Zoom. And then oh, another good thing that also uh, came out from this breakout session was be able to reach out globally, you know, trying to build, uh, uh, you know, engage and build partnership. 
But the question remains is, you know, what would that engagement and building partnerships, especially when you're reaching out globally, what would that look like? So these were some of the key things that we discussed. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Uh, all these sound so familiar. It's, uh, it's such a, you know, I don't know if that's good news or bad news. Uh, Philip, we'll come back to it. Oh, wait a minute, I missed Chris and I'll go, get way out of order here. Chris Taylor, would you go next, please? Um, Chris is not on the line. Okay, fine. Then we'll go down to Todd Warren. Great. We sort of split our time between two questions. Uh, uh, the, uh, the group from around the world, um, uh, uh, I think actually, which was <clears throat> the distance learning aspect. And um, uh, I think one of the things we're, we're, we're learning is that uh, remote causes us to lean even harder in on this idea that um, uh, uh, Steve and others got us doing with flipping the classroom. Like how do, how do you make your synchronous time more focused on collaboration, uh, both with you and the students as an instructor, but also among the students themselves? Um, and we talked a lot about using collab tools, you know, everything from, you know, from Discord to Mural to make that, that even better. Um, the other thing everybody realized was that we can bring more people in from outside the classroom. And that's not only the scaled theorists, like the guy who wrote the testing business ideas book can now appear for 10 minutes in your class, but also um, your constituents for customer development or with Main Street businesses, other local constituents, bringing those, those people into the classroom. So that was, that was on the teaching side. I was super interested to hear from a number of the people in the group about how they're dealing with Main Street businesses. And the big, the big thing, and, and I know I saw this with teams, teams, teams that were serving these customers uh, that I coached in the spring, but Main Street businesses had product market fit and now they're experiencing for the first time falling out of product market fit. And how do we provide scaled services to help coaching? And in the group, we had some people who had sent their students to help those local businesses uh, uh, in this time of need and pivoted their classes from doing the next app to helping mainstream businesses do it. And we had people doing that uh, uh, both in Africa and in San Jose. Um, and, uh, and with uh, hacking for the community in, in Hawaii and going out to rural areas, but still struggles with, with how to uh, engage, especially with rural communities to help them do that. So those were the insights from our uh, compacted little group. So, so were there any insights real quickly in terms of client acquisition, essentially, you know, finding, you know, people who were willing to accept help? Um, uh, yeah, there, there, was a, there was an insight that, especially when you go out to rural areas, that, um, um, that, that younger people who are, who are already fluent in the tools are more, are more likely to engage. But I would say we just barely scratched the surface of, mm -hmm. of that particular area, Jerry. All right, thank you very much, Todd. Jeff, Jeff Reed, please. All right. So uh, we had a wonderfully diverse group. We had folks from Israel, Egypt, Australia, and even two different parts of the Stanford University campus. <laughs> uh, and uh, a, co a few, we did uh, go around and, uh, and touch on a lot, but didn't get deep with much. But a few key things that I got out of it. One is um, getting out of the classroom in some ways can be a lot easier when you're never actually in a classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense that people are finding lots of uh, welcome connections with folks and they don't have the same travel and logistical challenges. So they found a lot of ways to connect. Uh, similarly, the idea that empathy and engagement is extremely scalable. So some of the core principles here have really scaled a lot. Uh, also say one other thing that one of our members contributed is that um, everybody has now lived through a pivot. So everybody has kind of experienced disruption and kind of is now maybe a little bit more open to looking at new ideas. Right, that's a positive way to look at the changes we're all going through. And I'm great, really glad to hear it. Thanks, Jeff. Mikey Koch. Thanks, Jerry. We also had a really eclectic and very inspiring group uh, from all around the world. 
Um, I think one of the things that we heard was, um, you know, in the online environment, it is a, a little bit more difficult to, to gauge feedback from teams. Um, we've had university faculty who said that hybrid classes are probably the most detrimental learning environment, um, that it's really difficult to maintain that one-on-one -on -one intimacy, but Zoom has been a passable kind of safe option. And that in keeping- uh, Micah, I, Micah, I heard part of that conversation when I was hopping around the rooms. Do you want to clarify what hybrid means? So uh, teaching both in person and virtually. Uh, simultaneously. Simultaneously, that's right. Wearing the mask and having cameras, but also people in the room and people online. I think the feeling was that was that was pretty detrimental mm -hmm. um, to to the to the quality of instruction. Um, you know, I think one of the other things that we heard in terms of the adaptation was just that, you know, it does take teams longer to get interviews. You can't just knock on doors, you know, that part of that, the hustle uh, of entrepreneurship, um, which is about, you know, getting into places where maybe you shouldn't be and finding the right people and asking them the right questions, much more difficult when you have to schedule Zoom meetings in advance. The flip side of that coin um, we, you know, we did hear that some people have more time on their calendars. I'm not quite sure who those people are, um, but, but getting Zoom interviews is actually easier. And so some of the discovery process has been easier online, but we, we spent a little bit of time, you know, talking about whether or not um, Zoom and virtual was actually a good substitute for the in-person, you know, watching people's pupils uh, uh, dilate uh, and describing their, their problem set. And then, um, you know, just the last, uh, part that I, I also want to emphasize is, you know, with respect to Main Street, um, uh, I think what we heard is that, you know, there's a lot of business owners who are really distracted, focused on day-to-day -day issues, you know, obviously impacted personally, and that looking at all aspects of the entrepreneur has been a real focus, um, prioritizing the human element, you know, when folks are dealing with uh, layoffs or cash flow issues or potential eviction that really focusing on what's important and being methodical is a real challenge. And so uh, the approach I think has changed from some of the instructors in our breakout room. Mm -hmm. A lot more flexibility needed. Thank you. Steve Weinstein. Hi. Um, so our um, session breakout room was on hacking for the environment oceans. And we had a, a a group where we were somewhat a little bit more talking to the group, but, you know, Emily Cotter brought up, you know, that there's a program at um, um, UCSB um, and that there are other programs going around, but all of the coastal universities, you know, are finding, you know, that taking this methodology should have and hopefully can have impact in these impact spaces um, and that you know, these courses are more complex to put on than even the hacking for defense type classes because you're trying to bring a divorce community together around the class. Dave, could you give one example on Hacking for Oceans of the type of sponsor that you would, you know, like that you would have for a project? Yeah, so um, they're usually going in a couple of categories. There's one in the, you know, the nonprofit area um, um, and, and also from the foundations or some from some of the coastal conservancy organizations, as well as we found some CEOs who are working in an area that's adjacent to what the, um, and they are hoping that people will work with them or help solve some of the problems. So you find CEOs of startups. Um, we work with a couple of those. We work with, um, and then you know the standard people who you think foundation people can impact, and third, um, the groups of you know the nation, you know conservancy type orgs. We haven't kind of branched out to like, and we had one venture also. Uh, there are venture funds that are starting to be impact funds particularly. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a very diverse group. You know, these are very big problems. And so you don't normally find, you know, the way you can, you know, somebody who owns this problem. It's more right. people working in this problem area. Right. Yeah. That's exactly the issue I was trying to drive at. Thank yeah. you very much for uh, you know, sharing that. I just want to mention right now that because there's so much going on in the chat, uh, we will be publishing a report based on this discussion, summarizing the general points from each of the um, uh, breakout groups, summarizing the points made by Lee Bollinger, et cetera. So um, also what's apparent is there's so much value in the chat. Please load any of your thoughts in the chat with valuable links, continue to do it uh, because we may just, uh, harvest 
uh, what's in the chat as well and put a summary or synopsis of that, as well as a list of useful links uh, offered by the attendees uh, in our report. So we have to edit that and look at that, but that's a thought that's emerging today. So please continue that practice. Todd Bache. Are you here? I am here. Great. Um, we, I think, like everybody, we had a great group. There were people from all over the world, from um, lots of different universities, and as far away as Curacao. And we even had a representative from the United Nations. So that was a really that gets interesting to perspective. Countries. <laughs> yeah. So if you add all that up, right? So that was really interesting to get that perspective as well. Um, Gladys was great. Some of the key takeaways that I think came out of the discussion was number one, the discussion was way too short. We could have talked a lot more in that breakout room. Um, usually crisis accelerates certain trends and that certainly happened with COVID. Uh, COVID kind of broke the myth that distant learning was problematic, isn't as effective, uh, forced everybody into this. And a lot of people came away with the feeling of, hey, for a lot of things, this works much better than we thought it was going to work. So I think that's going to be a carryover into when we can't go back, um, how to, to use that as a technique and not be afraid of it. Uh, people found that they can reach a much larger audience, even a worldwide audience. And that really opened up everybody, the educators' minds to um, that they can teach not just to this group, but to a much larger group. And it made me think of teachers without borders kind of thing that, uh, that the access uh, is really pushed out to everybody now, uh, much, much increased attendance. Team formation was something we talked a lot about. Um, teams usually gel. There's the old forming, storming, norming, performing kind of thing about teams. That happens through working together over time and socializing. And socializing is happens naturally in person. You go out to dinner after things, you go get pizza, you, you go, you, you hang out. That's much harder to do. So the team formations to really gel as a team can happen in this kind of distant environment, but it takes longer. That's what uh, several people said. It eventually happens if the teams meet on a regular basis and really connect over time. So the bonding does happen, but, but we need to find ways to do kind of distant socialization. So you're doing those kinds of activities in a way that does gel the team and make that work out. Um, students and often- And in yeah, conclusion. Yeah, yeah uh, I think the conclusions are uh, team formation happens, but it happens over time. And, uh, you reach a much larger audience. So I think those are our key points. Thank you, Todd. I'm sorry to have to push it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Todd Morrill. Um, hi, thanks. Uh, is there a requirement that everybody be named Todd on this phone call? Um, <laughs> I, and, 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 and all Todds have been called Scott. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly right, yeah. Um, uh, so in, in my breakout session and in our breakout session, the focus was pretty much on the first uh, first part of the suggested topics, which is sort of the mechanics of what works and what doesn't work. Um, uh, and I'm going to try to summarize, and I encourage the folks in the break room to holler when I get this wrong. Um, I'm going to break it into three, three pieces. The first is kind of, you know, what are the techniques that seem to work better in this virtual format as opposed to the more traditional one? And some of those are breaking things into very, very small chunks, bite-sized chunks, one-minute presentations, not 20-minute presentations for teams and uh, micro videos that people can watch to learn things. So in addition to a flipped classroom, which I think we've heard several times, it's just making things very, very bite-sized, even when you're all together online. Um, second idea that popped out was uh, in some of the institutions, they have asked the students to design the class. So you may choose a topic that's sort of the curriculum piece, but then the students design the class or at least help design the class. And the argument there, of course, is that's the audience you're speaking to by and large, you know, however you define students, because it could be anybody. Um, and in addition, they are more familiar with some of the tools that are available. And so you get ideas that wouldn't have occurred, for example, to me, an example being having Twitter be an integral part of the class. Um, uh, and of course, there are lots of other tools out there as well. 
Um, the, the third piece is finding collaboration tools which can be used both during the, let's call it Zoom sessions, but also outside of class. So ways that the teams can interact or students can interact as well as the overall class can interact, which happens both during the official hours as well as during the unofficial hours. And to the point that Todd just made about pizza, um, teams have a little more trouble forming and sort of norming under the current circumstances. So providing those tools is actually really important because they can't just go have a cup of coffee after class. They can't all get together at seven o'clock. Um, they can, but they don't for a whole set of reasons. Um, so th that was sort of the list of the, the, the mechanical things that help. Right. There is a philosophy. Go ahead. I'm going to say that getting the input from the students and what tools they are most fluent in is an interesting idea. Yeah, it's sort of a bottoms up approach. And I'm sure that, you know, you got to corral it to some extent. But having said that, I, I'd be willing to try. It sounds kind of interesting to me. Um, the, uh, the second thing, I two more things, just one quick one I want to touch on. There are some very non, I'm going to call them non-traditional solutions to big problems. So one of the folks in the breakout room teaches at Rio Grande University, uh, UT, which is, you know, one of the new universities, which is apparently somewhat uh, spread out around Southern Texas. And the students did not have access to good wife to, to good internet connections. So what the university did was built, improved their Wi-Fi so that it extended into the parking lot. Because the assumption was most of the students were going to be coming to class, that is once upon a time a year ago, so they could drive to the parking lot and then they could get fast Wi-Fi as opposed to trying, trying to do it from their houses where they simply did not have decent internet connection because it, regionally, there's just not much internet. So there's an example of something that the institution of higher learning can actually do to facilitate participation without having to buy everyone a router or having to run optical cable to everybody's house. Um, just a simple thing that really improves the overall experience. And the final point. Uh, last point. Um, to a certain extent, we're all fighting last year's battle now, if it all changes, we'll go back in person, that'll change. But look, Zoom is simply a classroom. It just happens to be electronic. And the breakout rooms are simply a break, a, a study section. It just happens to be electronic. You can't, I, I think you can build an argument that there are more innovative and more interesting ways to do this. I just don't know what they are yet. And so we nibble at that problem a lot, but I can't tell you if there are any specific solutions. But just having back, a bunch I'm of- I'm back when you have the solutions. Well, I hear you, but you, just this- <laughs> The Brady Bunch approach doesn't work for anybody, and it ain't going to survive once we figure out what the right way to do it is. Thanks for the inspiration, Todd, always. Uh, Jessica Fields. Hey, y'all. So we also kind of bounced around a little bit, but I think we could boil it down to sort of three key questions that we sort of addressed. Uh, in terms of best practices, we, we did hear the chunking concept that worked really well for students, um, and also kind of arraying those chunks of information in terms of more of a buffet than a monolith was easier for them to access. Uh, really making certain you boil your class down and reiterate, these are the five things you needed to take away from this discussion because at the end of the day, they are a little bit overwhelmed and students being overwhelmed was kind of a running concept. But some things that people have done to counter that were actually coming up with a concept called learning in service of the business and making it very clear what the learning path is towards that commercialization or towards that business development, and also what the different levels of proficiency are for those different paths of knowledge. And just really kind of working with the student or the team to build that concept out and to build that path cohesively. Um, I'd be interested to hear our panelists comment on this next one, but in terms of challenges, keeping mentors and investors engaged over the video was a bit of a problem. Uh, yeah. They managed to shorten and simplify the prezies that, that tended to help, but <clears throat> Q&A engagement is still a little bit of a struggle. So if anybody's got any other ideas on that, please drop those in the chat. Uh, the final thing, we really kind of went back to the main street and the concept of how do we kind of shift university services and capabilities into helping the main street, kind of going from uh, Bollinger's talk We've seen a few different variations of that kind of already starting in different locations. One I'm, I want to call it is the J School developed a COVID pen pal program in Kansas to try and get people to wear more masks, which was really interesting. 
Um, a number of places are sort of grouping students together in diverse teams of maybe six to eight. That also helps accommodate any potential drop off, but connecting them then with a Main Street local business and helping them build out a service. One of these that was really interesting was um, connecting an entrepreneurial students with waitresses and bartenders to help them figure out how to get additional funding to kind of compensate for the lack of subsidies they might not have been able to receive. So really just thinking at granular levels and it's not always a sexy company that the student gets to work with but they get to see real impact and it's something that they can use in their skill sets as project managers as they continue forward. So it's just some fascinating stuff coming out from that. that those are great takeaways, Jessica, especially like the last one that's highly original, working with the problem rather than working with an entity. Yeah, it's real fascinating. Their opportunity. That's, that's sort of a hacking for recovery approach and that's great. Um, see if Chris Taylor is back. You get one last shot, Chris. No, nope, he's adjourned, I guess. So let's go to Philip. Okay. Oh, you're uh, I know you're there. There you go. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Um, special thanks to uh, Diana Potcher and if, from Spain and Andrew Harries from Canada for taking the notes. Really appreciate that. Um, the, this will be a reiteration of some of the other points that were made. Um, and I'm just going to go down the list quickly. First of all, you know, it was observed that. Um, you know, that the teaching the class is actually better remote. Um, there are some uh, benefits to that. One of which was the uh, wallflowers within the class. You know, they get to use chat versus uh, if it's, you know, in person, they're not gonna participate at all. Um, in terms of, you know, the lecture, put that, make that available in advance of the class. And one uh, simple way of making sure that, you know, students, actually go through some of the advanced materials is to ask students to pose a question. They have to come up with a question, you know, about the material in advance. At least it's, uh, you know, something simple to get them uh, to engage and to um, go through that advanced materials. Um, in terms of, you know, just reiterating, you know, get to break everything up. Uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes, you know, it can't be anything longer than that. Keep everything very, very short. Um, also, yeah, the guest speakers, it's a lot easier to ask somebody to, you know, come in because they don't have to drive in, they can do it from their offices, etc. So you have actually a broader uh, access to more um, uh, guest lectures who can come in, which you students obviously love. Um, be sensitive to each of the personal situations. Um, students will turn off their videos, not because they're checking out, um, but because of, you know, their location. Um, you know, you, you want to be sensitive to that, of course. Um, one way around that is uh, one, of, one of the participants I, in, in our discussion um, has a house rule that um, participation is part of the uh, grade, but um, when they do talk, they have to put the camera on. So, you know, that's sort of a compromise on the sensitivity. One of the other observations uh, was, I think everybody knows this, as soon as you jump into a breakout, if as a professor, as you jump into the breakout, you're going to kill the discussion. So, you know, perhaps be sensitive, don't, don't jump in, let them uh, finish the discussion on their own. Um, Overall, there's a higher pressure to be more entertaining. Um, when we were talking about the curriculum, um, that's just something that has been experienced. Um, and the, in terms of the exams, what has changed uh, is that the exams, you know, they need to be testing more of the understanding um, and the application of concepts. One of the things that the remote learning has enabled is that you can have an exam, you know, that is open for, you know, 24 hours or six hours. Um, and then you're able to actually uh, ask the students to demonstrate more of the um, understanding of the concepts. Um, one thing we didn't get to, which was the Main Street businesses, but I happened to 
be familiar with it because I, I do a lot of work with SBDC, small business development centers. There are a thousand of them across the country as, as, as you may or may not know. Um, and so this is a challenge actually for Steve Blank. One of the things that um, I talk to them about the centers, there is a, I would say a very strong demand for a modified lean launch pad curriculum program for Main Street businesses. Um, what happens is that each of the individual small business development centers, um, you know, they're doing the best they can. They come up with a just getting started program. Um, they're all unique. Um, and I think that uh, they could certainly benefit um, from, you know, what at universities you've learned from um, the lean launch, lean launch pad, lean startup uh, approach. You know. I, thank you very much, Philip. I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to have to move on because the schedule has ten minutes and eight minutes, eight people to make their comments in ten minutes. Um, so, Jim, I'll be quick. Too much I'll be quick. Yeah. So, Ellen Sloan uh, talked about Greater LA focusing on Main Street getting businesses online, giving them social media skills, coaching on the canvas as a critical thing they were doing. Uh, Keith McGregor mentioned going in Puerto Rico and that this, the teams aren't done at the class. In fact, they were actually starting a real business during the class and talked about a need to extend beyond the canonical i core to post-class curriculum. Um, John Table mentioned from Western Massachusetts where they're not doing big tech spin-outs, but they're actually gonna be doing more local business in nature to understand how the larger ecosystem can be part of that. We also talk about the need to track more than team activity, more than just interviews, but to measure engagement with mentors and instructors and the insights that come from those engagements. You know, normal class, the questions come from the students, the answers come from the instructors. Very often it's inverted where we're asking the questions for our students to figure out. Um, lots of pivots come from the engagement. So the activity, the engagement, and then the insight. There's three kinds of mentors that we're talking about. There's the process mentors, kind of knowing what's coming up, technology mentors, and then market mentors. Zoom makes it easier to have more people involved, as someone already mentioned. Uh, we're also not restricted by the size of the classroom. So this year at Berkeley, we've gone from eight teams and 32 students to 16 teams and 80 students. Um, and I think hats off the Stanford's Hacking for Recovery is a first mover showing us how you can creatively increase the size of the cohort using breakout rooms and you know, we'll, we'll make a lot of mistakes in the process. Um, apparently the national program is now tactically mandated office hours every week. I know that at Berkeley in the beginning and Jerry was always on that um, part of the engagement. And heads up for new tools, class EDU has uh, been developing Zoom for education. I think we're lined up to be a beta. Michael Chasen who started Blackboard uh, has created this virtual connectivity that addresses some of the deficiencies of pure Zoom. And I'm excited to see what they can do to process. And that's it, Jerry, back to you. Thank you, Jim. Mike Moresco. Yes, um, I also will try to be extremely concise. So, um, uh, and just highlight some of the key insights that came out. So in the area of innovation, the concept of drive-in demo days, it was done in Florida, which um, I had never heard of before. I think that's a really interesting idea um, in terms of you know, comp you know balancing face-to-face -face versus um, versus not face-to-face. -face. A lot of discussion around how lots of deals are being done today over Zoom and venture capitalists and, and healthcare and education have, you know, have figured out how to do things and, and a platform that they've all had previously resisted until COVID uh, came in and that there's a lot of lessons learned there. Also discussion around sweet spots for customer development when you uh, that work best with Zoom and when, when that doesn't work best with Zoom um, and, the, and you know, the need for greater guidance to students around that point. Um, and then um, one, you know, one last point around the, the, important, the very important role the NVP plays today, especially um, when you're um, working in Zoom and the fact that if you can get the product if you, if you can get the product quickly, cheaply, and and and, and um, without using a, you know, a lot of funding, you you need to do that because that's going to get you a lot further along in terms of what you can learn from a customer development perspective. That's Thanks it. Thanks so much, Mike. That's super. Bob Dorf. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, we had a great, really amazing uh, group from all over the world, and 
folk just quickly some of the key problems uh, that came up. Uh, one is, hey, let's not forget homelessness in our encouragement of entrepreneurs to solve problems. It's been a horrible problem for decades, and it's going to be infinitely more horrible in 2021, at least in the United States and Latin America and probably much of the world. Uh, second challenge issue, I mean, most of the you know interacting with students and stuff has been covered. I'm going to skip through all of that. Uh, the, pushing more for diversity in founders, older people, Hispanics, women, uh, you know, pe brown and black people of all, of all flavors uh, who have more pressure on them in many cases in the current COVID world than they did uh, last year and making sure we're reaching out to them, dealing with their personal issues as well as their business issues and opportunities. And a sort of sidebar to that is reminding girls to get into STEM and encouraging that. Some of the interesting ideas that came up, one was teaching smaller niche kinds of cohorts, more focused on a specific vertical or a specific stage of startup life to expand the welcome mat, if you will, in those classes. Secondly, reaching out to, uh, Jerry and I are empathetic with this, older entrepreneurs, find them, pull them into the mix as mentors, sometimes as founders and coaches and so forth. Uh, they've got time, they're willing to help, use them. Uh, hats off to the University of Buckingham, which is not in the palace, but in an old palace apparently, where to graduate from the University of Buckingham, you must found a startup before you get your diploma. The startup doesn't have to succeed. And if it fails early enough, you get to do another one. But I thought that was a very interesting university graduation uh, requirement. Uh, and uh, to Ryerson College, who was, who was in the group, I don't have all the names legibly scribbled, where incubators at the university are open to entrepreneurs throughout the community, not just enrolled students, which leads to, I guess, my uh, second to last point, which is we, we as educators need to not treat solopreneurs or Main Street businesses as second class citizens. They're embracing the risks and challenges that, you know, big tech startups are embracing and they shouldn't be treated as second class uh, citizens in our classrooms, our incubators, or our meetups and things like that when we're having them. And that leads to my very last point, which is we all need to remember even more in these difficult times that many of the skills we're teaching like problem solving and running around the brick wall or through it are life skills that we're teaching. They're not restricted just to entrepreneurs. So that's, that's sort of the highlights from a terrific- well, Thanks, Bob. Thanks for reminding us. So, so Jerry, I'm gonna interrupt uh, to remind everybody that Bob Dorf was the co-author of the Startup Owners Annual Review. Uh, well, his enthusiasm hasn't diminished since he was kicking my butt. Uh, helping me write the book or actually writing the book and dragging me along with him. So, uh, right. Thanks, yeah. uh, thanks it was a Bob. wonderful, it was a wonderful startup in itself and the honor of my uh, professional startup career to been chosen to serve. <laughs> Bob, and we've all benefited from that. Well done, Steve. Um, so I also want to point out to everybody that all the um, moderators have taken on the chore of summarizing these main points, just a few bullet points, and they'll be part of our report at the end. Thank you very much. Um, so Tom, Medicare. Okay, so much of what we talked about were the positive things that came out of COVID. So we were the Pollyanna group and a lot of that about easier for teams to meet, mentors to meet, uh, easier access to speakers. Uh, one thing that, that hasn't been mentioned, there was a great example from Doug at the uh, University of Washington, St. Louis. He said one year ago in his class, he brought some uh, a, a video connection of some Silicon Valley VCs that he thought would add spice to the class. And, and the students said, what? 
they're not in person. What is this? You know, we don't get to have people in, in person. A year later, he had uh, VCs from Silicon Valley on Zoom, and the class was, this is amazing. We've got VCs from Silicon Valley in the class. And uh, we certainly saw that uh, in the Hacking for Defense class, Steve Blank and, and Joe Felker and, and Pete Newell had the most amazing set of speakers that came in week after week after week because they were pre-recorded at a time that was convenient for the speaker. Um, and one of the other things just to mention was uh, uh, Peter from COVID Free New Zealand said, uh, even though we, we are able to meet in person that they're gonna bring hybrid classes where there's remote and live combinations, which is I think another thing I think a lot of people have discovered that, that the benefits of, of adding remote to even to- We heard, we heard from one group that that's a death zone. So it'll be interesting to see how that experiment goes. That well, makes think, the two metaphors. Peter was talking about having some all in person and some all uh, remote. Okay. Not, cool. not the goober peanut butter half and half. Uh, Okay, cool. Thank you very much. That's great. Dave, uh, from the UK. Yeah, yeah, just echo a lot of the, the points already made about the uh, some of the lessons learned, build, measure, learn, after all. Um, so we've learned a lot and a uh, lot to take forward. Um, just one point I'd add, um, you say tomato, I say tomato. Um, your fourth leg or fourth whatever is our third leg in Europe. Um, so uh, when we need some more translation here between um, your fourth mission and uh, Europe's third mission um, about enterprise and, and engagement. And, and certainly there's, I think, a lot that we can learn uh, across, the, across the water from experiences in France, in Israel uh, and in the, in the UK. Um, and uh, the only concluding point is, is uh, to really bring some of these big challenges back to students. Um, they're, they're, we're still seeing too many apps for X um, and perhaps not a, 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 you know, enough willingness perhaps on some of our students to engage with some of the, the really big topics of the of the day. And so the grand challenges shouldn't just be for the university, the grand challenges, the people who are going to respond to that should be should be our students, should be the next generation of entrepreneurs. So how do we mobilize them to, to really go after big, audacious problems rather than apps for X? So um, yeah, and that's, that's me. On that, Dave, just an echo on that. It, is uh, the hacking for approach, like flipping, you know, lean launchpad on its head, where you start with the problem rather than starting with the capability, you know, leans in that direction. So I appreciate that enthusiasm for that. Thank you. Hey, Paul Fox. Absolutely. Barcelona. Okay, thanks, Jerry. So uh, I know you'll rush me along because we're, <laughs> we're late in the day, but um, I, I don't want to repeat a lot of things that people have said it just to say, uh, that for the most part, people think that we're doing better online than ever. Uh, we, we figured out a lot of things. Um, in, in class, it's easier to get people to participate than ever, but maybe it's difficult to keep momentum, uh, especially when you're, you get into the hard part of, of customer discovery. In customer discovery, uh, there were kind of mixed results where, where we were able to get more people engaged, to get more people do more interviews and, and because people are more available online, but maybe couldn't go as deep and couldn't do more of the informal observation that, that's part of uh, really getting to, to some insights. So it's more people's impressions than, than being able to observe uh, the reality of what's happening. Um, the, the, I, th I think a few things that, that help is to about, about this hybrid idea is minimizing the amount of kind of uh, presentations and putting more, more of the lectures online and spending more time in the, in the breakout rooms in smaller groups because this is where engagement really happens. Um, the, the, there's a point about how community building is, is very challenging uh, in this context. So even though you're able to get across, get to a lot of the learning objectives, you're missing a lot of these intangibles. And so when we talked about uh, what the future is, you know, uh, Jerry, you, you asked about this hybrid word. I've heard this, I've heard hybrid and blended a million times, and it means different things to everyone. And so one, uh, one point that was made is that going forward to, to have a lot of the, the lectures and, and things put online and to spend uh, in-person time for community building and doing more of these uh, these informal intangibles um, that, that we're missing now now online, and that's great. Let's all remember what a pioneer Steve Blank was in putting these lectures online 
and bringing the flipped classroom to scale. So thank you very much for mentioning that, Paul. Phil from uh, VentureWell. Yeah, um, I will also try to make this uh, very quick. We, we talked about a lot of things that have been talked about. I um, Just in summary, sort of the, the thread that went through this is that um, COVID and going virtual has changed everything and actually not changed that much, uh, both at the same time. And, and all of the, the uh, examples have been described of being able to increase access um, and including, there were some great examples given of providing really different access, uh, for example, enabling students in Africa to participate in programs, I think it was in Australia, um, which had never happened before and, and was sort of an opportunity to think more broadly about the where the, the uh, watershed is for a particular course. The other aspect of that is that um, you have to think differently about the needs of that broader uh, array of students and plan for that. There was a fair amount of discussion about the importance of actually doing good instructional design, which it was pointed out is, is uh, time consuming and significant uh, work to do up front, but it pays off in uh, enabling much better um, engagement and retention and um, also being ready to really understand that, that um, it takes longer for people to absorb information sometimes. And there's a real need to have a diversity of tools and points of access for people to engage them where they are and enable them to succeed with uh, what their objectives are. We also had some discussion around tools um, and the evolution of tools, which continues at a breakneck pace. And uh, I think that might actually be a topic we wanna have a conversation around the next time we come together. I think that's a great idea, Phil. I just want to point out that VentureWell is a great organization and a great resource to all entrepreneurship professors. Uh, they even offer grants that you can apply for, for money to build new courses, et cetera. And VentureWell was the first uh, founding uh, sponsor for uh, the summit program back uh, a year ago today. So uh, thank you for all you've done, Phil, to help build this uh, community. Oh, great, great and to continue as a partner. And, and uh, people should understand that the VentureWell website has an uh, enormous amount of uh, information and data for entrepreneurship. And they also put on a great set of conferences uh, every year as well, and uh, um, usually important for our community. Absolutely. And last but not least, Stephanie Maris, who hosted the very first uh, healthcare uh, Lean Launchpad i -Corps program. Stephanie. Thanks, Jerry. You always make it easy for me by putting me last, so there's not much new that I can contribute to this discussion. Well, thank um, you very much, Stephanie. <laughs> hang on. Uh, I just wanted to reinforce, I think Todd Bash, Bash said earlier about the worldwide audience that's now possible, which is um, a huge strength and has network benefits that people can't always anticipate. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to stop right there. I'm okay. doing a global online course, as you know. Of course, you have your global online course. That's fantastic. So you are really reaching out internationally. Well, with that, I don't want to try and summarize the summaries, but I do want to say that this conversation is ongoing on the Slack channel that I will post again at the end of the program in just a few minutes. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all the summaries from the discussion leaders and we'll harvest what we can from those and, uh, you know, Put it out in some endurable way. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to move uh, to closing remarks if we can. And um, Steve, I'm going to ask you to um, go first if I can. What are your impressions of the day in, in a few minutes? Well, you know, I'll just make it very short, Jerry, which is uh, We've built an, an enormous community, and more importantly, we continue to learn from each other. Um, you know, what surprises me is both ends of this conversation is, one is how long uh, Lean, which I, uh, you know, thought with customer development and then Eric's contribution of Agile and Osterwalder's contribution of the business model canvas would be kind of a passing fad, and then we'd move on to something else. Um, but in fact, instead of just an evolutionary uh, kind of it was better, it turned out it was actually a, a revolutionary sea change. And, and so it's lasted uh, for decades now. And, and so that's been a surprise on one end. 
On the other end, is that every one of the participants today are making this better with new insights, new tools, new observations, um, better ways to teach, um, better uh, ideas. And in this group will be the next replacement for Lean as well. Um, you know, uh, when, uh, when Jerry got me into teaching, the canonical book, the gold standard was by Jeff Timmons on how to write a business plan. And it was the best book ever written on how to write a business plan. 472 pages that basically, uh, Jerry, what was it? The team something and something there. Technology and people. Yeah, team, technology and people. <laughs> I'm uh, all and, money. I'm sorry. and it was <laughs> the pinnacle of how to do that. You know, Lean just basically said, well, that's great, but that's not the, that's not the problem we're solving. I think with the changes is our, in our community, um, in, in, in financing and the, the nature of entrepreneurship now being everywhere, there will be something that follows. And, uh, uh, but in the meantime, I'm just incredibly impressed about this community that, that uh, just is making us all smarter as we're trying to make our students smarter. Re remember what our goal is, is to educate a class of innovators and entrepreneurs who, who are not gonna just make the the next best social media app, but we'll have the next medicine or next you know, way to make people's lives better. And that's what our jobs are, is to encourage that generation and give them the tools to do that. So uh, thank you all for, for coming together and making our community better and, and, and our students better and, and ultimately the world better. Jerry? Sure. Steve Weinstein, a few closing comments. Um, I just want to reiterate what um, Steve and Jerry have been saying. I'm proud to be part of a community that seems to be growing unbelievably fast, you know, spreading out into so many different dimensions of trying to make a big difference in the world rather than a small difference in the world. And I'm, uh, I encourage you all to get involved on the Slack channel and look at the re resources at VentureWell, if you haven't, and, and Common Mission Project and take advantage of them and hopefully contribute even more of the stuff that you're all doing because I learn every, a lot every time I'm part of these sessions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Pete? Okay, I guess it's my chore to deliver the homework assignment then. Um, I'll reiterate, please, please, please join the Slack channel. Um, it is the best, fastest way we can ensure that these really rich conversations continue. Um, but don't just join. Uh, if, if you have a topic that you're passionate about and, and you're really interested in, please nominate the topic and then volunteer to moderate the channel. If you have tools or techniques or articles or other things, please plug them into the channel. It, it is a, a fantastic growing resource for all of us. And I think uh, as of today, there are probably 400 of us on there. But uh, let, let's make sure that we continue the dialogue past today so that when we show up in June for the next one, we're, we're literally on a rocket ship to helping change happen in our communities. Thanks, Steve. And my name's still Jerry, but thanks, Pete. <laughs> so, boy, I get to bring it home, and I'm really glad. Can we share the um, slides again, please? Um, because I want to show the Slack channel. So we started the day with uh, the challenge of how can we best help our students succeed in the new economy? You know, whether their dreams are high tech ventures or Main Street businesses, and how can we help them uh, be resilient and have uh, you know the impact and outcomes they want? And I think this discussion did address those issues. And I'm very, very pleased by that. The um, challenge right now is how do we move forward? And uh, I want to reiterate uh, joining the Slack channel, joining the community, and of course, um, joining us next time. And uh, we have picked a date. It's going to be June 3rd, that's to be confirmed. But if you want to jot down on your calendars, June 3rd, and help us spread the word. There's no reason um, we shouldn't be sharing with each other in broad communities. Uh, and so help us spread that word. 
And lastly, I want to, you know, thank everyone just one last time, if I can. You know, I want to thank our speakers uh, who were very generous with their time. Of course, our panelists, uh, the breakout room leads who have stuck with us all day and made this all work uh, for us. You know, our organizers and outreach sponsors, you know, uh, GCEC, you know, the Global Entrepreneurship Center Consortium and VentureWell, and of course, the Common Mission Project. And especially, I want to call out uh, Logan Potasik, who's just, um, you know, been the uh, quarterback, who's really made this all uh, work with her team um, at the Common Mission Project. So thank you all. And I look forward to um, working with you all in this great community. It's, it's a great personal reward for me to be a part of such a movement. And I know that word gets overused, but we are a movement. And, you know, when we hear from Columbia University that they're, they're going to add a fourth leg to the stool, you know, I had to hear in my own ears that everybody in this room has been working in that direction uh, for a long time. And when I look at the screen and I see all your faces, I know you can help your universities engage and you already are. So thank you all for participating today. And I look forward to seeing you all as the year progresses in a post COVID world. Come on vaccines. See you all soon. Bye bye. Thank you, Jerry. Bye. Hey, everybody. Thanks. Be well and stay Bye. safe. Bye. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, Jerry and Steve and everyone. Happy Thanks, holidays, everyone. everyone. Happy holiday and be safe. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Big hug from Mexico. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Javier, good to see you in Barcelona. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Logan. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Really Thank you, Adelia. How much you go? Wonderful, you. wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also for me, this was my first time. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Bye, Bye Pedro. Good to see you in the global community. Aloha, mahalo from Hawaii. <laughs> Thank you, mahalo. Bye from England. Bye, Nigel. Good to meet you. <clears throat> Thank you. Bye-bye, Yali. Jerry, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Are you on the Slack channel or do you have a LinkedIn? Uh, jsengel at berkeley.edu is really the most direct. J.S. Engel. I just okay. went through the um, uh, Venture Capital University program. Uh, at UC Berkeley and I, I'm curious, uh, 